Hello, this is Angela with Parker's Permaculture. Welcome back to House Frau Friday. This is a weekly segment where I veer a little bit away from the normal subjects of gardening and social permaculture and resilient food production. And I talk about how we can apply permaculture principles, sustainable living, ecological consciousness to the domestic sphere. Everybody has a home. You don't have to be a homemaker to take care of a home. And the subjects that we talk about on House Frau Friday are applicable to everybody. I can tell as I am making this video, this is a new a new bodice that I just made and I used scraps of toile de jouy and then um, an old curtain. And I can tell I'm test running it, it's too big. Um, can you see how it's too tall in the shoulder? It fits great everywhere else. I don't wanna knock my camera over, so I'll stand up and show you here. It fits great everywhere else. Nice, good fit too tall in the shoulders. So I'm gonna need to come in and take that down a little bit and fix that. Um, just gonna drive me crazy this whole video. So maybe I'll actually just take it off and just wear my dress. Okay, one of the perks of doing hand sewing is that if you screw something up or if you purchase something that is not tailor-made to you, you can fix it you can do alterations. So I'm gonna come in here. I sewed this all by hand, so I'm just gonna pop this seam on the inside and I'm gonna shorten the shoulder about that much and then it's gonna fit great because it fits everywhere else. So I got requests to do a, a video where I show how I sew all of the bodices that I make for myself and for my daughters. And I will do that coming up. They're a great way to use up little scraps of fabric. So um, I'll definitely be sure and cover that, but not today. Permaculture has a tendency to focus a lot on uh, responding to and designing um, ways of growing food that are alternative to industrial agriculture. And we can get a little bit myopic when we do that. Permaculture means permanent agriculture, but it also means permanent culture. Anything that has to do with designing systems for humans to live and dwell in a way that is not extractive of the planet and is not exploitive of other humans falls under the auspices of permaculture. That includes our clothing production. Now, I have a number of videos, including one about fast fashion way back when I first started talking on camera and I was very nervous and didn't like doing it. So you should go check that out if you wanna see me being heckin' awkward. But I'm really interested in slow and sustainable fashion. I love to read about slow and sustainable fashion. In fact, I'm gonna talk in a moment about a book that I recently read that I just thought was, was wonderful. Um, when we're discussing how we produce our food, many of those elements and valid points and valid criticisms of industrial agriculture are applicable to clothing production, to textile manufacturing. Especially when we talk about localizing our food economies. Why are we not localizing our fiber economies, our textile economies as well? I am very privileged that I live in Oregon. I've said this a lot on this channel. I know folks who don't live in Oregon may have certain preconceived notions that have been perpetuated in the media about what it's like to live here, but I love my state. There's so many wonderful things about it. Um, not the very high income tax, but the rest of it. I love the climate, it's perfect for gardening. And I love the people, I love the mountains, I love the ocean. One of the unique things that we have located here in Oregon is the Pendleton Woolen Mill. And they are a really shining example for how we can think about textile production and begin to make steps that are more sustainable. So Pendleton textiles are world renowned. They are very commonly used to make graduation blankets and ceremonial blankets for indigenous communities. My husband used to teach at a tribal school. He's actually taught at multiple tribal schools, but he used to teach at a tribal school and the graduation gift they would give the students would be a Pendleton blanket. So there are many um, indigenous and tribal inspired uh, textiles that they weave and produce and that are widely accepted and welcomed and utilized by indigenous communities around uh, North America. And they also make all kinds of other woolen textiles for um, very fine quality shirting, very fine quality um, wool for skirts, for coats, uh, for blankets. They make the whole run of, of textiles. Someone commented on one of my recent videos about permaculture that they didn't really understand what it was. And the more they read about it, the more they were like, not quite sure. Permaculture means permanent agriculture. It is a portmanteau of permanent and agriculture, but also a portmanteau of permanent and culture. 
any ways that human beings are striving to create a way of living that is not extractive toward the environment or exploitive toward other people and improves the quality of life and resiliency for human communities, that's permaculture. Those design principles, there are 12 of them and three ethics, are applicable not just to growing food. In fact, they never were meant to be applicable only to growing food. They're also intended from the get-go to be about how we design our house, how we design and place our house in the landscape. Backing up, how we design our neighborhoods, how we design our whole cities, how we design our economies, how we design our ways of communicating, transporting, and connecting community to community. It's looking for all that interconnectedness and striving to make it more efficient and more equitable and more just. We cannot exclude the way that we produce our clothing when we think about permaculture. There's several videos on uh, textiles and garments in general. I love to sew. A big part of the uh, skill set for and 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 like hobby interest set for me in terms of my domestic skills is sewing and mending and being able to take a garment and extend its life, being able to take something and tailor it to fit, being able to keep textiles out of the waste stream and in circulation in use until they're at the actual real end of their life. That's ecologically responsible. When we look for a local fiber economy, and I highly suggest you read the book Fiber Shed, and I will link to their website down in the description as well. When we look to creating local textile economies, much like we're looking to create local food economies, we build resilience and we also can reduce our impact on the planet. Pendleton Woolen Mills are an example of how we can think about localizing our textile economy, utilizing local producers of the fiber, spinning it locally, weaving it locally, producing garments locally. Now, Pendleton Woolen Mills are over 100 years old. They use sheep um, farmers, they utilize sheep farmers in Oregon and Washington in um, much of the, the West Coast, but they do strive to be um, sustainable in their choices of wool and they have great information on their website. They have a really um, strong desire to have ethical work environments and to source their wool sustainably when they, when they possibly can within the context of living in capitalist American economy. So for me, I love to make a trip to Pendleton Woolen Mills. I try to wear all natural fiber clothing whenever I can. I talk about that, about why um, for me, I've really tried to transition away from synthetics, why they're not good for us, they're not good for the planet. It's not perfect, I'm not able to do it perfectly, but um, whenever I can, especially if I'm buying new garments, I want to bring in something that at the end of its life I can compost it. So I had a video recently where I talked about how I sourced some fabric from the thrift store. And, uh, you know, one of my kids said, said to me, like, Mom, that's that's well and good, but like maybe not everybody has a great thrift store like we do. Or like maybe folks aren't going to stumble upon exactly what they need at the thrift store, but they need to make a new garment at home. Sometimes we have to buy new. And so I thought I would show what we got at the Pendleton Woolen Mill today, explain a little bit about what it's like. When you go and you buy new textiles and your desire is to have something that has a long life and that you can return to the earth at the end of it, your options are gonna be cotton, linen, and wool, for the most part. There are a few exceptions, right? Um, there's hemp fibers, there's bamboo fibers, things like that. Um, for me, I love to wear wool. It's cold and rainy here in the winter. Wool continues to insulate you well, even when it's completely wet. It is breathable to wear in the summer. It's very well insulating in the winter. Wool is a really versatile textile. I've done a few videos where I have shown some of the linen that I've bought and some of the sewing that I do with linen because it makes a wonderful either undergarment or a wonderful summer weight material. But here it is rainy and cold and I wear a lot of wool in the winter. One of the best things about wool is it has extreme longevity. You can wear a wool garment 20 or 30,000 times before it begins to wear out. In fact, I have elements in my wool wardrobe that are hand-me-downs for my mother and some for my grandmother that are still in good condition. Eventually wool does rot and you do need to compost it because it is a natural fiber, but it has a much longer lifespan than other kinds of uh, textiles. Now, Pendleton Woolen Mill strives to, again, source their wool from Oregon and Washington uh, woolen producers whenever they can. All of their textiles are woven here in Oregon or right across the river in Washougal, Washington. It's very local. You can't get any more local than that. They can't do it perfectly, but they do a really good job. 
The wool that comes out of Pendleton Woolen Mill is probably prohibitively expensive for a lot of people. And for me, it definitely is. Very fine quality wool. Shirting is gonna run you 40, 60, 80 dollars a yard. So it is marketed toward a certain kind of clientele, right? And for those of us that wanna live a more sustainable life, we just don't have access to that. And I think that's one of the unique things about thinking about how we have to operate in a capitalist system is that there is some element of needing to market toward those who have a lot of um, expendable wealth, toward those who have accumulated um, disproportionate quantities of wealth and who like to buy luxury goods and can afford to buy luxury goods in order to keep sustainable businesses going. So I'm not sure how well some of these local textile producers, folks seeking to hyper-localize textile production, could actually... Um, continue to succeed and operate their businesses if it weren't for that unfortunate dynamic of like, right now we're dependent on a really high level of um, inequity, disparate uh, incomes, disparate living conditions, quality of life and level of luxury in America to, to try and drive these sustainable industries. But perhaps that's more of an argument for another time. So we went to the Pendleton Woolen Mill um, it's a beautiful store. They sell the, uh, some of the actual garments that you can buy. Um, maybe they are end lot, maybe they're seconds, but they also strive very much to have no waste whenever they can. So that means the outlet has all of the seconds that they couldn't use for manufacturing their clothing or sell off the bolt normally. I got this material for, um, this was a big splurge for me, $15 a yard. It's very fine very nice wool and I wish you could see I'll try and photograph it in the light it looks a little bit army green here but it's not it's this beautiful green with flecks of blue and brown and in it and so when you hold it in the light it looks like all kinds of different colors it's really lovely my daughter said it reminds her of tv static and that it's visually very very interesting that was tv static was like a mom this is so cool it looks like tv static um so I'm gonna make a skirt out of this. In fact, I'm gonna make an 18th century a pleated skirt that's tied at the sides. I have made a linen one. I'll cut in a video here, a clip here. I've made a linen one. I really like pleated full skirts. As a tall person with big hips, I find that they're, um, they're flattering on me and they're comfortable and I can have those big pockets inside. So I'm gonna make a skirt out of this um, in a video soon, but I wanted to show you what happens when you buy seconds. This is material that would have been $40 a yard new. I got it for 15. When they say seconds, there are flaws in it and they tape where the flaws are. So for this skirt, there was one, or this material, I should say, it's gonna be a skirt. There was one flaw there. And then the two other flaws are very small and they're so small that like I could hardly find them and they're along the selvage edge. So for me using this fabric, like this is something they couldn't sell, they couldn't use. They sold it in their outlet. It's a waste product. It's three yards of beautiful, beautiful wool that I'm gonna turn into a very warm winter skirt that I will wear for years and years and years. Oh, having an 18th century adjustable tie waist skirt means that if my um, shape and size changes over the years, the skirt still fits. So this, um, Material I'm gonna make into a skirt. I'll probably make a video where I show how to do it. But for me, buying something that is seconds means I can afford it, it's in my budget, it's locally locally raised wool, locally spun. I'm supporting local American textile workers in an industry that's really struggling. And it's a garment that I will wear for years and years and years and years and years, maybe hand down to my kids, and then can be composted at the end. My supply chain is staying very, very local. Everything from the Northwest. That feels really good to me. It feels like investing in, you know, this was $45 for three yards. Um, I will have fabric left over when I um, am done making this to maybe make something else very small, like perhaps a waistcoat or something for one of my kids. This is a skirt that I will wear for a long period of time and get more than my money's worth out of it. And I'm supporting a local industry. So that felt really good to me, when I'm thinking about being an ecological homemaker, when I'm thinking about how I dress my body, how am I living out my values in the way I put clothes on my body? Now, everybody has the luxury of being able to afford new fabric. $45 is a lot of money for me. It's a lot of money for me. And I will say the reason that I considered buying this in the first place is because my favorite winter skirt that I made when I was 25 years old, I am now 43, has gotten two big worn patches in the behind and I can't wear it anymore. So I really needed a new winter skirt. So this felt like the best option for me.
while we were there, I bought two other pieces of wool, sets of um, wool that I'm going to make into um, skirts as well. This one's going to be for my daughter. This was, I think it was like $5.99 a yard, $9.99 a yard. And Ruth is really small and she's always cold. So I thought this would be great to make her a skirt that she can also wear for a really long time. Maybe I'll teach her how to make it. Maybe this will be a learning opportunity, an unschooling opportunity, even though she's about to start college. You never stop being an unschooler. And then I bought this plaid because I want to make a skirt for me out of this as well. This is gonna be a learning experiment for me. I don't generally sew with plaid because it's very fiddly and there's usually a lot of wastage when you're trying to match plaid. And so I am gonna make a skirt because that feels like something that I will wear a lot, that I have a shortage of, and um, it feels like something where there will be less waste for the fabric. So I'm probably not going to do a gorge skirt. I'm probably going to do a pleated skirt to keep it simple. But this was such a pretty autumnal wool. And again, woven right here in Oregon. This is seconds that was not suitable, that in a consumptive society would be a waste product, but instead they can still use it as a revenue stream and I can still have access to high quality, sustainable wool that um, otherwise would be out of my budget. So to me, that feels really good. Now, briefly, I want to say I read a book called uh, Vanishing Fleece, and that was sort of my inspiration for wanting to go and visit the Pendleton Woolen Mill. I typically go once every year or two because I don't make that much in the way of clothes. At the beginning of the pandemic, I made a Victorian walking skirt out of wool that they had on sale for $5.99 a yard. It was crazy cheap. And that was more of a like experiment. I'd never made a Victorian style skirt before. And I wear that skirt in the winter. It's almost too warm by the time I wear petticoats underneath it for our um, relatively mild winters. Like if I was still in Iowa, I would wear the heck out of that skirt. But it was more of an exercise for me. And I want these two skirts to be really practical everyday skirts. So I chose a thinner wool. Oh, another thing I wanna say about this really quickly before I talk about Vanishing Fleece. Sorry to jump around a little bit, a little stream of consciousness today. This is one of their wools that really um, doesn't unravel. It's it's felted a little bit. What's called fulling when you do it to a woven fabric. And that means I think that I'm not going to have to fell over my seams. I'm not going to have to double fold and stitch my seams down when I finish the seams on my garment. So that means um, I have a little bit more wiggle room and how to get everything out of this fabric because my seams are going to be a little bit easier to work with. So I read this book, Vanishing Fleece, and... It's a wonderful um, breakdown of the woolen industry in America and why it's really struggling and why we have sacrificed our very important local North American, much more sustainable textile industry because of fast fashion. We have shipped so much of it overseas and we have stopped producing so much in the way of natural fiber and gone much more towards synthetics with aniline dyes. And we are... Um, having those manufactured overseas where we're often not paying workers an equitable wage. Um, the book Fiber Shed talks about that quite a bit. But when we look at trying to spin our own brand of yarn, which is what the author of this book did um, in Vanishing Fleece, where she wanted to start from sheep and go all the way to the finished yarn and see what was that process of, of production like from sourcing it from a local sustainable sheep rancher to having the wool cleaned um, to having the wool carded, to having the wool spun, and then to having it plied into yarn um, and then dyed. All of that process she wanted to keep in the United States. And so um, this is a really fascinating dive into struggles that we face as folks wanting to design more resilient textile industry the struggles that we face because we have lost so much of the infrastructure. She talks about like how many of the weavers, the woolen mills in the um, United States have gone out of business. And those that are still operating are using 80 or 100 year old machines for which there are no mechanics and there are no replacement parts anymore. And how difficult it is for folks wanting to, to try and uh, get away from the industrial fast fashion, uh, overseas, exploitive of our workers, way that we are making and selling our clothes, trying to return to a more sustainable, organic, natural fiber, um, fair wage, local, local, local way of producing our textiles. We can't because we've lost all of the infrastructure. We have seen so much of the means of producing sustainable textiles 
just fade away in America because there's no profit in it anymore. There is no way for those industries to be competitive. And so they've just sold off. They've given up. They've closed up shop. So when we're looking at permaculture design and we're looking at what we can do to create a more resilient and sustainable world, we can't just say, well, let's just create a local fiber economy. Let's create a local textile economy and source our clothes locally. I can do that through Pendleton Woolen Mill because I have a highly functional 100 plus year operation that is profitable and successful in my backyard. Most people do not have that. How can we get back to that? How can we get back to creating those sustainable local chains? Well, we have to re-engineer all of our infrastructure. It's a huge undertaking. And this is where I think folks don't necessarily think about what permaculture entails if we actually want to make it achievable and successful. If we actually want real systemic change, it's a heck ton of work, especially on the community level, on the cultural level, on the national level, and on the global level. It is a very complicated, intricate process. When we look at something as simple as how can we have more local sheep farmers? How can we take that wool, wash it, cart it, spin it, weave it, dye it, make it into a cloth, clothing item, make it into a garment, all within our backyard, all locally, so that we reduce our carbon footprint, we support our local producers and artisans and designers, our local farmers, there's just no infrastructure there. You go to say it like, oh yes, this is a wonderful dream, let's do it. I, I have nobody I can contract with to do this. So when we're looking at permaculture design, it can't be a fantasy, but it also is gonna take some very uncomfortable amount of realizing the workload that is ahead of us. So we gotta open our eyes a little bit. People tend to think that permaculturists are living in la-la land. Um, I know that one of the, there's a Facebook group that I really like, Phytomimetics, and the guy who runs it loves to kind of scoff at permaculturists as being very silly and idealistic. I don't want to be idealistic. I want to have actual efficacious change. And to do that, we've got to figure out how we can have systemic infrastructural changes that lend themselves to sustainability that are following permaculture principles and ethics. For those of us that are homemakers, for those of us that want to have more sustainability, more eco-consciousness in the domestic sphere, the best we can do is what are our local producers? How can we support them? How can we keep our textile clothing chain as short as possible? How can we choose natural fiber clothing that we can then compost at the end of its life? How can we choose garments that wear longer and better and then are not going to pollute the environment when we're done with them? And what choices can we make with our budgeting and, perhaps, budgeting and perhaps the size of our wardrobe in order to be able to afford to do that? For me, it means I'm, I have a much smaller wardrobe. As much as I love to sew, I have a much smaller wardrobe than your average American woman because I am conscientious about what I put into my wardrobe. And the garments that I invest in, same with my shoes that I invest in, I want them to last a really long amount of time. I've spoken in the past about how like I don't give crap about modern fashions. When you choose to not care what the current fashion trend is, it's amazing how long your skirt will stay fashionable. You can just wear the heck out of that thing. It doesn't wear out. It's not become obsolete because you don't care about fast fashion. So I'm going to do a follow-up video where I show how to make a really simple 18th century skirt. It's not... Um, it might be a little, it might be a little bit until I get around to doing it. I want to have this done by October when the cold weather comes in. And I'd like to do a couple more sewing videos. This is not a history bounding channel, but I did get requests to talk about a little bit more sewing in practicality. For those of us that are thinking about wanting to have permaculture design and wanting to live a more sustainable life, we've got to extend that to our textiles. For me, that's something that I think about frequently as I'm clothing myself and my five other family members. I think about it frequently. What is the long-term impact what is the earth care when it comes to my clothing? And what is the people care when it comes to my clothing? What is happening to the garment workers who are making either the garments that I buy ready-made or the textiles that I turn into garments? What is their quality of life? And also people care in terms of future people on this planet. What am I gifting them? Something that will compost and return to the earth? Or am I gifting them something that will become microplastic pollution in the end, like acrylics? So 
Um, we can't do everything perfectly. I talk a lot on this channel about how like we can't do it perfectly. We're stuck in a super broken system, but we have to start imagining ways that we can shift towards sustainability and take whatever steps are accessible to us. And at the same time, push for folks, those, those folks with more power and influence than us, uh, elected officials in particular, think about electing folks who will uphold our values and want to create a more just and sustainable world. So thank you for watching House Frau Friday today. If you are out here in Western Oregon, I hope you will get a chance to visit uh, Pendleton. I hope that you are able to find sources of sustainable natural fiber, either textiles or fully made garments in your area. Think about investing in those local industries that are struggling so much to maintain their equipment, struggling to maintain their businesses and stay alive. Support those local designers, those local artisans, those local farmers and ranchers as much as you possibly can. And I will be back tomorrow from outdoors in my permaculture garden. Oh, please click like and subscribe. By the way, I'm almost to 25,000 subscribers. And if you um, could just give that little click, that would be amazing. Thanks.